Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the best practice session four. This is a session organized between GGANs and Pirelli. And today we have a, a, a quite full agenda. We'll start with Dr. Ted Moreau. We'll continue with Jeff Franklin, who we will welcome again to give his uh, weather update. I will continue with a, a vineyard I, um, update about some activities and what to do in the vineyard. And we'll finish with our typical discussion. Okay, so I would like to welcome Dr. Deb Moreau from AFC, Kendall Research Station, and she will be giving a, a short update about the insect development this season in the province and providing some information on uh, caterpillar management. Deb, please. Thanks, Francisco. Thumbs up, everyone can see that? Yes, looks perfect. Okay. Great. Um, thanks everyone. Uh, thanks for the invite, Francisco. Um, this is going to be a, well, I'm hoping it's a very brief update of what we're seeing this year. I probably should have followed Jeff so I could have leaned on some of the weather data, but. So as everyone can appreciate this spring was, um, we saw, you know, cumulative degree days um, ramp up much, much earlier than certainly the last few years, um, which definitely favored the insects. Um, so it's from my perspective as an entomologist, it's nice to see things kind of leveling out a little bit. Um, so what this means for insects largely in the summer is that the the, the more heat, uh, most, most insects are temperature dependent, their development. So the more heat, uh, the faster they can whip through a life cycle. So egg through to adult. And then potentially with some species, the more generations we see in a year. So as you can appreciate, that's problematic. So I, I wanna spend a little more time on caterpillars because I think I typically gloss over those. So this is just kind of a clump together, um, five insects that when I'm out and about, these are the ones that I'm seeing more often than others. There, there's lots of things happening right now, and I'm sure most of you have seen the odd cicada lately, um, but these are the ones that I'm probably seeing, um, you know, numbers that I would either expect or, or, or I'm a little bit surprised. So, I'm just going to whip through and I'm open to questions at the end. So certainly we're seeing phylloxera, we're seeing lots of gulls, and we have approximately 80 of our bucket traps uh, currently sprinkled um, throughout the valley. And we're monitoring the uh, root feeding form. So numbers uh, have been steadily climbing. The good news is they're, they seem to be uh, favoring some varieties over others. Those of you who grow Frontenac will know, um, you know that, that they are quite susceptible to the leaf feeding form. Uh, Marquette seems to host um, good sized populations of the root feeding. So this year we're spending a lot of time looking at what are the impacts and um, hopefully um, as we continue to crunch the numbers um, later this fall or next spring, we'll have something to be able to show you. And it may possibly at this time the manage Movento, which is not um, for organic systems. And at this time, there's there's very little out there for for phylloxera management in organic production except for some of the more cultural controls. We are, we meaning uh, a colleague and I in Ontario are talking about some trials that we're going to hopefully start next year to look at non-chemical alternatives to managing. So I am seeing quite a bit of flea beetle damage to leaves, especially on young vines. This little guy here is the red-headed flea beetle, but I'm also seeing a lot of grape flea beetle. So this is typically something 
any of the economic thresholds that exist in the northeastern states are typically for when it's much earlier and they're feeding on the woolly buds. Um, and at that time, you would kind of go around, you would sample 10 buds from each of 10 vines, and then you would look to see sort of the percentage um, affected. So I think the threshold out of Michigan might be, I think it's 2% damage, um, but there really aren't any established thresholds for leaf damage. And Mature vines can usually sustain a fair amount of feeding damage. The younger vines, I will agree, it's problematic. Um, and it's really gonna come down to the degree of the damage you're seeing and whether you want to monitor or manage. There's all kinds of irinium mite out there, but again, as in all years, it's really patchy in its distribution. Uh, I see it in some varieties and not in others. Um, so you'll see in the image here, um, you'll see the sort of blisters or what we, they're really galls. Um, so I, I think there's still lots of good things that work against this. Some of the predator, predatory mites that we do see in the vineyards in Nova Scotia are in good numbers. So I think you'll get, you know, there is some level of biological control happening. I mean, you can use sulfur in the early seasons to manage this, but I, but I've not seen enough of it to, I think, to be managing. It's, it's a lot of money to manage these with chemicals. Other things probably will, will knock this down when you're spraying for something else. And two things I'm seeing, I mean, we do see earwigs, you know, every year. Um, this year I, I'm seeing more than usual. I don't know if it's the humidity. Um, again, I think, I would call an ear, I would think of an earwig more beneficial than anything. It's going to be eating some of, some of the small eggs and larvae of other insects. It can be problematic when it gets in the clusters and it, it leaves brass behind. There are some very cool, very cost-effective do-it-yourself traps. If you find, let's say your vineyard has a lot of wooden posts and they're getting up there and there's, there's good numbers of them falling out from the cracks. Um, there's really cool stuff you can do with corrugated cardboard um, that, that will kind of trap them and you can remove some of them out of the vineyard. Uh, tarnished plant bug is, it's always cited as a pest in grape and I've really kind of not paid much attention to it. For those of you who grow anything else. Um, it has over 400 hosts that it likes to, to feed on. So it's kind of everywhere. It can, um, it is known that it can have an entire life cycle in grapes. So it can go from egg to adult in the, in the vineyard quite handily. Um, I wouldn't worry so much about the adults. I mean, both the adults and nymphs are sap sucking, but um, you're not gonna get feeding on the leaves or anything like that. When the nymphs, um, the nymphs can actually attack the pedicels, which, which will impact sort of fruit set. But since we're past that, I think uh, it's just a really good year for tarnish. So if you're seeing a lot of these, um, they're probably moving around on, on other crops that are nearby or adjacent flowers. Most of these pests, um, with the exception of phylloxera, do really well with kind of having patches of wildflowers, um, other things outside of the vineyard that can attract them there. So just a little time on the common caterpillars. I know over the years, folks feel that like they're seeing more and more leaf folders and leaf rollers. Uh, I've added the sphinx moth, which I'll talk about uh, in a minute. So I've included under the sort of common, just the common headings, um, examples of each. So I know in, in Nova Scotia, we have uh, Desmia funeralis, and we also have the red banded leaf roller. And the, this, this particular one is, I won't say it's rare, but it's far less common than we see the leaf roller. So the red banded leaf roller is a tortricid. Um, it's a common, with the tortricids, which is a group of moths, they're very common leaf rollers. Toward this particular one, red banded, uh, is a common pest of apple. So it's not surprising that we find a lot of it in our vineyards here, given how much 
alcohol is in production. It can be, uh, you know, it, it, it has some lookalike things to Great Berry Moth, which I'll talk about after. Uh, it's also another tritricid. So you'll see these sort of tight rolling, and then you can see sort of little bits of webbing that they use to kind of secure the roll um, together. With red banded, by the time, at some point, the caterpillar will kind of move in and out and eat and eat and eat, and then it usually comes in here and rolls up the leaf, and this is where it pupates. Red banded can go into the clusters and it can feed superficially on the grapes. Um, so if you're seeing high numbers, uh, it may be something that you, you might want to consider managing. Typically, uh, these three paths do not need management overall. And I'm speaking very generally, not vineyard specific. They have really limited economic impact. So, um, and lots of things can influence the year, the variety, all of those things. The good news with, with leaf rollers and leaf folders, there are products for both systems. So if you're an organic grower, um, there are products that can be used for this. They certainly don't have the bang of a conventional product, um, but they, they have some level of efficacy. I want to draw a little bit of attention to the, we call them commonly the sphinx moths. Um, these are big. These can be, you know, two, three inches. Okay, I should go into metric, but I can't, not on this, on the fly. So these are very large caterpillars. Um, they're voracious eaters. Typically, um, the adults are sort of coming in off hardwoods on the adjacent to the vineyard, um, but then the caterpillars are, the vineyard is really a convenient feeding source for the kids. And they can eat, they can defoliate vines very quickly. I would not recommend spraying for them because they're really patchy in terms of where they are in the vineyard. So you'd be putting a lot of product um, in the block and not necessarily coming into contact with these. And some of the new, many of the old contact products aren't even available now. And so a lot of the newer products, you, the caterpillar actually has to ingest it. So it makes the probability of a hit a little bit more difficult. So this is kind of may raise um, some, some eyebrows. It's a little bit of a nick factor, but the easiest way because of how big these are is to take a little bucket with some soap and water, wear gloves if you need to, and just kind of pick them off and put them in the soapy water. Um, and that will deal with that individual. So I do have had reports of some vineyards finding a ton of these. Um, and again, if your vineyard's young or for, it's not, not fully established, meaning it's less than five years, then then this can be problematic with some of the younger vines. So um, this, I'm kind of going to segue a little bit. Um, we had a, this work, this particular work here is under one of the activities under the national cluster that GGANS and the province of Nova Scotia have supported. So we have been, uh, one of our questions is to sort of look at invasives and I call them potential new records. So it's basically either insects that have been here for a while, but we're not causing a problem or insects that are native to all the regions around us, but we've no, we have no reports here in Nova Scotia. So we're looking at that for the province. It all Monitoring is key. And so getting a handle on whether these pests are even in the province is our first priority. So spotted wing, the four that are on our list are spotted wing drosophila. This is a small, a lot of people call it a vinegar fly. So the flies that, you know, at this time of year, um, if you eat a banana and the banana peel sits on your kitchen counter, it's a relative of this particular fly that will, will kind of pick up on the yeast and the sort of overriping um, odors that are coming off the banana peel and be tracked. So spotted wing Drosophila or, or Drosophila suzukii is a very close relative of the typical fly that goes near your banana peels or your compost. What makes this different 
is this the this is the female here so the common name is based on the male it has two small spotted wings uh, spots on its wing the female's ovipositor so that's the structure on the insect that allows her in this particular species it allows her to land on the grape slice it open so her ovipositor has an uh, kind of a serrated edge like you would see on a steak knife it allows her to land kind of make a little slice or slit in the grape and then she inserts her egg so the eggs develop in the fruit itself and they will cause and often the fruit doesn't leave the cluster of the vine it just kind of goes soft as the maggots within the fruit kind of feed on the flesh um, in 2016, we did some work on this pest in grape, um, looking at a white and a red variety. And we did not see, um, certainly wine grape was very low on the list in terms of preference for this fly. So thin skinned fruits like raspberries and blackberries, and then um, kind of sweeter berries, strawberries, things like that, they were all up at the top. And then as you kind of went down, the list grapes were closer to the bottom. There's been some reports out of Italy that they've seen some problems with this fly in some of the very thin skinned um, grapes there, but we've not seen it here. Nonetheless, we have been monitoring over the years in vineyards and we do find spotted wing in there all the time. We've not seen appreciable damage to the fruit. It can be problematic in September. So this is kind of a, it comes along lately. So if you're going to monitor, I would, I would say don't start, don't waste your time until, till probably mid August. Um, that's usually when we start seeing, you know, sustained catches and then numbers will ramp up quite quickly. It's the, what's critical for you as producers is the timing of high population. So high numbers of this fly and the fruit being ripe, because this, this fly is attracted to the ripe fruit. There's an easy trap, it's a vinegar baited trap. Uh, it's really just a red solo cup, or some of you may recognize it's a red beer cup. Um, we have tons and I'm happy to help if you're, if you're concerned, you're starting to see softening grapes, uh, let me know and we can certainly do something um, in your vineyard. So yeah, I, I'm keeping an eye out for this one. If you have reasons to be concerned, just again, to, just to let me know. The multicolored Asian lady beetle, um, that's been here for quite some time. And again, the big problem with this, um, it's a standard, you know, it's related to the other uh, ladybugs. So it's a, a great predator of things we don't want like mealybug and aphids and aphid eggs. The problem with this one is its ability to sort of ramp up in numbers. And so for, for ladybugs, anyone who lives in an old home um, may know that in the winter, ladybugs like to come together and sort of congregate in large numbers. And so when the clusters are good and ripe, often the sugars are high and the clusters are nice and tight, these guys can get in there and they can cause quite a problem. Um, and so the chemical that they, that they emit causes the ladybug, what they call the ladybug taint in one. Again, we've been monitoring this closely, I'd say for four years and in the last year more earnestly uh, connected with some work that Wendy McFadden Smith is doing out of Ontario. And although we see this, we don't see it in it. I've had no reports of it being a problem come harvest. So um, Japanese beetle, this is one, um, it is more of an indirect, so it's going to impact uh, the leaves, not the, not the fruit itself. It is a relative of June bugs, so the grubs are in the turf or the soil, um, and then the adults come out. Typically when they come out, they come out all at once. They often cluster together, so where you see one feeding, you will almost always see others. Um, I would start monitoring, I mean, you're, you're at fruit set now. We, um, in my travels a week ago, I want to say, um, I did see these, I kind of checked at the source and I did see them in, um, in on the South Shore. So this is um, 
This is a past that is thought to have, I think I've told the story many times, but it's thought to come have come into Canada through the Yarmouth Ferry. It's a great hitchhiker. Um, and it just kind of stayed put around Liverpool area. And there's kind of a, a very established breeding population there. And it hasn't moved forever until about five years ago. And it started to slowly move. And so now we have found it up in the Annapolis Valley and we see it spreading east from Liverpool. Um, I have seen it as far as Rose Bay, but I know that there are reports that they have found it in Halifax. So it feeds on many, many hosts, uh, anything in the rosacea family, so, um, so lots of hosts. But I'm asking folks to sort of pay attention to this one. When they get into your vineyard, um, because of numbers, uh, they can do quite a bit of damage to foliage, especially again, if you have a new, a new planting. And the one that I'm most concerned with is the great berry moth. Um, there are a number of generations. We're not, because we don't have a record for this pest in Nova Scotia still. I have a question mark here. This was an image that was supplied to me last year by a local producer. And um, unfortunately, by the time we, it was just, by the time we picked it up, the, we weren't able to actually ID the sample. And so um, caterpillars, we would likely take it back to the lab and do something, um, use molecular tools to, to get at the root of this. And as you know, last year, uh, there were some limitations. So, um, so I have a question mark, but I'm very, we, we have all the right conditions. Um, the only thing we don't have the great Mary moth is typically linked quite tightly with is wild grape. Um, wild grape was not known to be native to Nova Scotia. I know folks have sort of brought some, some in, but so we, we may still be lucky, but, um, but something to definitely uh, keep your eye on. And so this is a heads up. Uh, I have sent something to Vanessa to distribute to the grape growers. We're kind of going to focus on these two. So I'm reaching out to all of you for help. If you uh, see these or have clusters with webbing, anything like that, there'll be a lot more details in the letter. Please reach out to me and, um, and I would be happy to pay a visit and collect and take these off your hands. And before I exit, I just kind of have one little um, public health message. While we're speaking about uh, climate change and sort of changes in insects, this was a particularly big year in terms of the number of ticks that people were either bringing to me or writing to me about and showing me images. And also the, uh, there seemed to be an increase from last year in a number of folks who've been confirmed diagnosed with, um, with Lyme. So, um, and, and some of these are coming from, from the valley. So I'm just kind of my, uh, if I take my hat off as an entomologist and Deb Moreau friend, um, you know, please, please continue to be diligent with this. Um, numbers are high this year. I suspect the winter was quite kind to some of the hosts. So I don't see this problem going away anytime soon. And that's it for me. Um, really big huge shout out for continued support from the grape growers i mean really you know this really isn't possible without the work that you're doing and of course cgcn is very involved in the work we do including the cluster work and i probably should have meant i mean i work very closely with francisco and other colleagues in perennia but some of the philosopher work we're doing is has he has graciously um agreed to let me dovetail into some of his terroir work. So uh, thank you. Thank you uh, very much uh, for your nice presentation. It's quite interesting. If somebody has any question, please on the bottom of your screen, you will have a Q&A feature. So we have one question there. It's from Sharon saying, thank you, Deb. Can you comment a bit more on the foliar versus root phylloxera you mentioned and on the impact of different types of the overall health of vines, particularly Marquette and Petit Pearl? 
Yeah, that's a really good question, Sharon. So the literature suggests that leaf feeding form, so please keep in mind that the leaf feeding form and the root feeding form are the exact same population. So these, these exist together on the same vine or within the same block. But the, the literature suggests that the leaf feeding form or the damage caused by the galls and the leaf feeding is negligible to most mature vines. There's been some recent thought about possible uh, reduction in photosynthesis, those types of things, possible um, sugar sinks and things like that. And we are, um, we are looking into that, but the bigger piece is the root feeding. So by and large, the root feeding portion of the population is the one that causes the greatest impact to, to vine vigor. And depending on the variety, um, it can be quite severe. So um, once populations get in there, there are certain varieties that are um, so susceptible that it's just a matter of years before the vines succumb to the, pre to the pressure of the feeding or the root damage. So the damage that they do to the roots is both, it's through their feeding, which causes little sort of tumors or galls, but it also is um, secondary and allows for openings of other things. So plant parasitic nematodes, other, other pathogens. So it's kind of a double whammy, but it does, uh, it does impact the vine. It does impact the vigor. When they look at, if you're buying vines, often you'll see a little sort of chart that tells you, you know, resistant, tolerant, susceptible. Um, and those are kind of very broad categories of how the vine will do. It can vary by where it's planted, um, if it's on rootstock, all of those things. So I'm not, so definitely the root feeding form is more impactful of the vine. There is also a discussion um, out of Austria and New Zealand, or Australia, pardon me, that um, there's some talk about uh, at certain times of the year that the galls kind of draw carbon and things to the roots themselves, places, places where the plant itself can't really get to. So they lock some of that stuff up that's good for the phylloxera, but not necessarily good for the vine. But um, yeah, so, so definitely um, the, the root form is worse. Did that answer your question, Sharon? I'm sure we will see an answer quite soon. So uh, Sharon, please reach out to me and it might be a better conversation for you and I standing in the vineyard. Okay, we don't have any more questions and give it time. Thank you, will do. Okay, uh, well, I wanted to make uh, ask you something else, but it's time and I know Jeff Franklin uh, requires time. So thank you very much, Jeff, for such a nice presentation, quite informative and let us know a couple of priorities. So as usual, we have the pleasure to have Jeff Franklin from AFC Kenville to inform us a little bit about the weather, climatic conditions, and the impact in the vines. Jeff, please. Okay, so can you see that uh, okay? Yes, it's possible. Thank you. Back here. So, uh, for how always uh, fun to come and chat about weather. Uh, never get tired of it. So I uh, I'll dive right into it. So lo looking looking back at uh, the year in review. So if you look at this slide, this is a slide I, I show this every time, but I'll explain it briefly to let you know what you're looking at. So the individual points are the daily average temperatures for every day so far in 2021. So right up to I think yesterday was the last date, and the the thick gray line is the trend line. So that's the temperature that we, we would expect, the temperature that we'd expect to see uh, as we move through time. So what's interesting about this, when, when you look at this and you just look from a temperature perspective at how the year has been, 
we've been, had a lot of above average temperature weather. We had a blast it early in January, February. We had it again in March and April. We definitely had it in June, but that has not held out uh, into July. So if you look at the, uh, the two items I've just circled there, so above average uh, in June, and these were significantly above average. Uh, I'm, I'm not, I have to go back and see if we broke any temperature records, but there was definitely a sustained period of above average temperature. And those two circled events kind of have driven our phenology to a great degree. Because you've got to remember, I mean, grapes really didn't, really don't begin to move phenologically speaking until sometime in May. So events like the ones we see here in June and to a lesser extent, uh, middle of July, they really drive phenology. But lately, uh, we've had some below average temperatures. So if you, if you felt that July was cooler than what you expected, you were right, you, you sense that perfectly. It, it definitely has been uh, lower than average. So the net effect of this, if we look at, at the temperatures by number, uh, so the mean temperature in 2021 uh, for June was 18.9 degrees Celsius. And compared to the, the 10 year average for the same month, uh, which was 16. So that's a deviation, a positive deviation this year, warmer than the 10 year average by almost three degrees. That's, that's huge. <laughs> when you see uh, a month like that, that's, that's three degrees above average, that's a significant shift. But then if we turn around and look at July, uh, and it, interestingly enough, if you look at the average temperature for July compared to the average temperature for June, there's only 0.2 degrees of a difference. And there should be you know, more than a degree difference between July and June, but that's because our July has been quite cool. And it's actually about one and a half degrees below the 10 year average. So, the additional heat that we got in June, which drove phenology, has been partially offset by a cooler July. Although that, that's not necessarily a bad thing. I'm not, I'm not saying this is, hasn't been a good year. There's been more positives than negative. Um, however, that leads to growing degree days and heat units. And we use this, we use heat units as a, a proxy for plant development. So the thick red line is the development of heat units through 2021. And the dotted line is the 10 year average. So we've been ahead in terms of heat units, ahead of the 10 year average since early in June. And, and that, that's been quite consistent. But what's interesting here, there's, there's three times where that, the slope of that line gets quite steep. And those were the times when temperatures were significantly above average. Those, those were the events in June, uh, mid June, late June, and, and a smaller one in July. And that's when our phenology was probably driven by, driven the fastest. Um, uncommon events, there was so much vigor, it was hard to keep up with things. I swear you can, see, you can sit in the vineyard and almost hear it grow. So, but, but again, because July was cooler than average, we've seen a little bit of a, of a retreat in the uh, development of heat units. Uh, and we're just slightly behind the 2020 and 2018 years, which were both very good years. So we're in that area. If, if I look at the forecast, I suspect we're going to regain that again, more warm weather coming, and some thoughts that this will be continued on through the fall. But of course, you can't just look at temperature. There are other factors here. And uh, one that's been certainly on my mind lately uh, has been the amount of rain. So again, the thick red line is the 2021 data, and the black line is the 10-year mean. So we've been running slightly below average in precipitation since the first of the year. Um, hasn't been a big factor because usually there's sufficient moisture in the ground, uh, certainly up till July um, for plant development, for, for normal plant development and things aren't water stressed. Uh, and as you can see, there has been significant events and I have the one marked here, the thunderstorms that we received here in Kentville on July 21st, where between that, the day of the thunderstorms and the next day, we, we received 83 millimeters of rain. So that's pretty well the average for the whole month of July. We received that in, in 24 hours. And so total for all of July, we received 164 millimeters of rain, which is double uh, the 10 year average for what we, that's double what we would expect to see. So just breaking down July a, a little farther, because some of you, if you're, if you're tuning in from places like Yarmouth or some other places, you're thinking, well, we, we haven't seen that much rain. And that's true. I mean, when we talk about the, the 164 millimeters of rain that we've seen in Kentville, 
Some of that has been incredibly local precipitation uh, coming on the heels of thunderstorms. So you can see that the red bar there shows the, the total precipitation for July, 164 millimeters. And it's, it's pretty well double the, the average for July, the 10 year average. But the other gray bars are just the other years in, in my average. So 2011 to 2020. And I put those up there just really to show you the amount of variability. We can have as few as 20 millimeters of rain in the month of July, and we can have close to 200. Um, but when we get those big years, that's often because we've had tropical weather or thunderstorms that drive that. And in fact, that, that uh, event that we had on July 21st, that's the thunder and lightning storm, the one where the propane tank at, at the Walmart was, was hit, we received 50 millimeters of rain in about 45 minutes. And that's, uh, that, that's almost as high as you can, you can see on the precipitation scale. Um, we actually had some periods of time where we were receiving two millimeters a minute. And that's, uh, that's almost at the top of the scale for rate of precipitation. Those were very heavy showers. So why am I making such a fuss about this? Um, the implications for all that rain, there are a couple. So one is, of course, uh, disease. Danny mildew and botrytis both thrive in wet conditions. And although powdery mildew, not so much, it's not so much that it thrives in wet conditions, but the fungicides that we apply to plants to protect for powdery mildew are, of course, washed off by rain. And periods of heavy rain are especially detrimental to that. Of course, the other issue is that uh, soil moisture and heat equals vigor. We definitely have sufficient soil moisture right now. Um, so yeah, we are, we're above average here, but if you, looking at the distribution of that precipitation through the province, Kempfel definitely wins the prize at 164 millimeters. And you can kind of see, if you look at this, there's a swath of, 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 of precipitation that sort of runs through the center of the province from west to east. Uh, so Kempfel Greenwood, Halifax, and then up through Sydney, where we've had a lot of um, seasonally active weather. But of course, south of that line, or maybe around Caribou Point, uh, they've been less impacted like from that. But there have been this, this band of precipitation that's moved through the center of the province, coming on the heels of storms that have given us a lot, a lot of rain. So what has that meant for soil temperatures? Um, I actually had the, I guess call it the privilege of digging some 16, 20 inch holes the other day. And I can guarantee you that the soil is, the profile of the moisture in the soil is right down through to 20, 20 um, uh, 16 inches. So what would that be? 30, 40, you know, 40, 50 centimeters. And so this is uh, this, this uh, plot of soil temperatures. This is temperatures measured at 35 centimeters. So about a foot down on the ground. And those temperatures for, again, 2021 is the red line have stayed fairly consistently high. But if you look at the, uh, the circled areas, there have been significant drops. And of course, those have come because of the penetration of rain down through the soil levels, penetrating all the way down to 35 centimeters. So that is an indication that, that the rains aren't just hitting and running off. We're actually getting some penetration into the soil. And that's a good thing for most crops. Um, I'll let others speak to whether or not it's an issue for grapes. Um, it certainly has been good for anybody who planted this year. Uh, those plants are getting sufficient moisture and certainly no, no signs of water stress anywhere. So that's sort of the weather in review, but really what, what does all that mean? So where are we in terms of phenology? So I went out today, really at the end of the day, right after the, the rain broke, uh, to take pictures of some clusters. So I took Lacadie, that which is on the left, Chardonnay, which is the middle pane, and our Marquette, which is on the right. So definitely the, the bunches have closed up, the berries have sized up. Uh, Chardonnay, I don't think they're going to close up much more. Certainly it didn't look like ours would. Those clusters are tight. Um, very good berry size that I, that I saw today. What was interesting is, the, of course, the panel on the right. It's our Marquette. That's our most uh, precocious variety in our block. And they're just showing some signs of very early veraison, some signs of color change. And you could actually uh, pinch that fruit and see it was starting to soften. So when I, I remember last year, this happened, similar thing. We saw these clusters. I was in a frantic text conversation with Steve Ells. And when I look back to when this happened last year, that was August the 10th. So that maybe makes us about five days ahead of 2020. Um, all that heat in June and some that we've seen in July have, have definitely paid off in terms of phenology. 
looking at the seasonal forecast, I have two seasonal forecasts here. One is, of course, uh, I was put out on 31st of May. I've showed you that one before. And one that was just put out the other day, uh, uh, the 31st of July. So on the 31st of May, they certainly called for us to have above average temperatures in Nova Scotia. That held true in June, certainly much less so in July. In fact, we were below average. But overall, if we look at that whole period, we are above average. So I guess in this case, the seasonal forecast was accurate. But if we look at the, at the forecast on the right, um, we lose confidence a little bit that this is going to continue through the summer. We're down to, uh, I think back in May, we were looking at 90 to 100% confidence that we were going to see above average weather or temperatures. And now in uh, the most recent forecast, we're down to maybe 70 to 80% confidence. But nonetheless, uh, it, it would appear that we are not going to have a below average growing season. This, the forecast from the 31st of July goes right through to the end of October. It would appear that uh, as much as you can put faith in the forecast, that we are going to see some some warmer temperatures. And that's all I have. Pause to see if there are any questions here. Thank you very much, uh, Jeff, for such a nice uh, presentation and on time, I have to tell you. I will wait for a little bit for, for if if we receive any questions, please, sure. uh, you can see the Q&A feature on the bottom of the screen if you have any questions to, to Jeff. Jeff, uh, I, I will ask you, meanwhile, um, did you see any hail when we had this thund thunderstorm on that day? So certainly, in Campbell, our vineyard, the research vineyard would be centered on Campbell. I saw no signs of hail damage. Uh, in fact, we didn't see it at any other crops at the research station. But I do understand if you go north of there, uh, around the Perot area, there was some hail. And certainly in the Wolfel Windsor area, there were some localized spots of hail. I can't tell you exactly where they were. Um, uh, I just know from uh, different reports of people seeing some hail strikes in those areas. So, I mean, that, 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 those thunderstorms on the 21st, and then uh, I think three or four days later, there was another system that passed through. They were definitely capable of producing fairly large swaths of hail, um, although I have not heard of people reporting serious damage. Okay, yes, it, it was the same question in the Q&A future uh, now about the hail, because I know we have in some areas, and I will mention something very briefly. Sharon is saying, fortunately, we didn't get any Falmouth, all the lots in Windsor. Yeah. Yeah. And that was quite interesting. The last week they had a huge hail, was super yeah. weird. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Jeff, I think that was all the questions. I will continue on time. I'm very proud of us. So thank you very much for, for the nice uh, update. So, because my colleague is not introducing me, I will introduce myself. Uh, thank you very much. As you know, my name is Francisco Diaz. I'm the viticulture specialist at Perenia. And today I want to talk a little bit about the uh, vineyard activities uh, before veraison. I know we have been talking a little bit this topic uh, in previous presentations, but I want to, to highlight and reinforce. As already Jeff mentioned and Sharon was asking, I will talk super brief about hail events, a uh, little of observation and strategies in case, and hopefully we don't, but we have a case again. Also, I will be talking products against downy mildew, uh, some products about post-infection and also about black rot, because I know some growers, they have, have issues with black rot, uh, due to these extreme humid conditions. And also locally systemic and group M and suppression ones. The third point will be attention to botrytis, important times and which products we can get. Um, before going to our discussion at the end, I will talk briefly about before variation. So canopy management, which is a very important tool and a tissue sampling. So as uh, it was already mentioned, we had a lot of rain through July, and especially uh, the last two weeks. 
And we had Hegel events on Thursday, July 22, and on Tuesday, July 27. But it was very precise in very specific locations like parts of Port Williams, Wallfield, Grand Pre, um, and Windsor. And again, depending the areas, uh, you have more or less a hail, which was uh, different in duration and intensity. Okay? So, as you can see in this picture, here we have a bunch of, I think, was Chardonnay, which had some impact of, of hail. And you can see how the berries, they were open and split. So, well, this is also combined, maybe they had some calcium deficiency, but anyway, it was affected by hail and they had these open berries. So important, in case of having damage with open berries, pay attention to botrytis. So if it, this is happening, I recommend you to be scouting like at least two times per week and be paying attention on if you have or not some development of botrytis and apply is something in botrytis. As you can see in this photo, I will see in the next slides, we were almost in bunch closure here. So the botrytis application was necessary, but keep in mind, if you have that, pay attention immediately if, uh, if you have a split berries. And if you have a split berries in the next couple of weeks, apply immediately something against botrytis. So I will be mentioning now products against mildew. And I will start with post-infection and black rot, okay? So for the post-infection, ah, and before I continue, a lot of, or the majority of my, the part of this presentation is coming from a presentation done last year by Dr. Kevin Kerr in the summer tour. So if you want to get more information or see the whole presentation about these topics, you can go to the great blog and you can see the publication of May 6 about a spray a publication. And there you will see the link to, to watch the, the whole presentation. But in this case, I will talk about post-infection and blood rot. And these are products from group 33, which are Postrol, Rampart, and Aliet. These are pre and post-infection activity. And they are usually used at the beginning of the season. But if you haven't used them yet, these are very good options. So five to seven days interval under high pressure. And this high pressure, I mean, or the plants are growing too fast. That's why it's five days. So you have to cover and continue protecting the, the plant and the areas. Or if you have too much rain, as was mentioned in ATF before. But it's usually because when the plants are growing too fast. Even though uh, the group 33 has a good protection again, uh, down in mildew, it's not efficacy to form opsis on black rot. Okay, so now I want to mention other products from group three, which are primarily against powdery mildew, but they have a very good activity against black rot. Okay, so keep in mind if you need something against powdery and down in mildew, but I, you are also having black rot. These products are quite uh, good. Nova, Seva, Fullback, and Metal. But pay attention to the REIs because you require 12 hours for Seva, seven days to Nova and Fullback, and 15 days uh, for Metal. Some locally uh, systemic products. Here we have different groups Torrent, Group 21. Pristine, which is seven plus 11, Fostro, Rampart, Confin, Extra, and Aliet, they are from group 33, Rebus, Forum, 40, and Sampro, 40 plus 45, okay? Please remember, I'm highlighting all the time the groups because it's always to be rotating groups and to don't have two applications in a row with the same product, okay? So, Torrent, and Rebus and Forum, which are different groups, 21 and 40, they have an excellent for forward protection and some post-infection, okay, against downy mildew. Meanwhile, from the group 33, you have good forward protection and better 
post-infection and anti-sporulation. This is something very good to keep in mind because you have options in case that you have an infection down in India, especially in these conditions with high precipitation and warm temperatures that you have tools. But attention, no more than two applications to avoid resistance. And with this, I mean, for example, I wouldn't do two applications of torrent in a row or three applications of torrent in a row. You can be making a torrent, rivers, and phosphor. You can be changing the products. Don't overuse the same group, please. I will be repeating this all the time through my presentation. We have other group, it's the group M or the suppression. And here we have the typicals, all the coppers, the 53W, the spray, oxychloride, cueva, and cosite. But also we have others like Folpan, Sopran, Timorex, and Stargus. Okay, usually organics are limited to copper, only copper. And well, the other producers, you, and you have the, the uh, in the case you are conventional, other products as, as Folpan or Sovereign. And it's important to highlight that group M are known as multi-site inhibitors, and they are less prone to develop resistance. However, it's very good to be changing and, and using other products because we need to approach this with an integrated pest management, okay? Even though group M is not prone, uh, prone to, to resistance, it's good to be changing it. Now let's pass to botrytis, because again, as Jeff has explained, botrytis uh, will be present and with the hail event that we have, just let's pay attention. So we have a couple of important times. One is the post bloom, which already passed. Now, depending on your variety and the location, you can be in very touch or even in bunch closure, okay? And the other one is duration, and we could include a fourth, which is between duration and harvest, which is the ripening period. So, consideration, the exclusive products, and with this, I mean products that are only for botrytis, just leave it until ripening. So if you need something like this called silver bullet, you will have the product and it will be there for you. And important, again, as I have been saying uh, since a while, rotate products between applications from other groups. So we'll avoid creating resistance. So some products we have, Genja from uh, group seven, Scala nine, Luna Tranquility seven plus nine, Switch 9 plus 12, Elevate 17, Mirabis Prime with 7 plus 12, Pristine 7 plus 11, and Inspire Super 3 plus 9. So attention again with the plant products. They can be followed by the same group. And with this, I mean the following, and I will put two examples. For example, if I am applying Luna Tranquility, which is 7 plus 9, and I want to apply Pristine 7 plus 11, I have to pay attention to the group 7. The same with Switch 9 plus 12, I cannot continue with Inspired Super, which is 3 plus 9. So it's not possible. Pay attention all the time of the groups that you are using and you're applying just to avoid passing to a product that you have already. Okay? And one good consideration is, for example, powdery mildew can be managed with Luna Tranquility, Inspire Super, and Mirai. So keep in mind uh, the groups. And organic products, because of course we have organic producers, and we have Serenade Opti, Serifel, Timorex Gold, Regalia Max, and Double Nickel. I put an start in everyone in each of these products because sometimes uh, the companies that are making the regulation and certifying the, the organics, they are changing. So before applying something, I recommend you, if you are uh, organic certified, to verify with this uh, body, okay? And priorities, well, these are mainly, as I, I said, a suppression. So priorities are the varieties with thin skin and tight clusters, such as Pinot Noir and Riesling. Again, attention, these are preventing products. So you have to apply this before seeing the disease. 
is forcing something. Otherwise, it's, it's become more difficult. Before operation, so this is briefly, it's cannabis management. I know I have been repeating or we have been discussing through the season a lot about cannabis management. And now is the time about the leaf thing and a particular area of the fruit zone, which can be done by hand or machines, okay? And in what consists this is the elimination of leaves at fruit zone, because this will improve the air circulation and sun exposure. As you can see, here is completely clean, all the, the bunches, this is a wrestling. The berries are completely exposed to the sun. This will help to develop a flavors, aromas, but also the, it will dry faster, will move the air faster, and they will have some sun exposure, and the fungicides will penetrate easier, okay? And, and about teaching something, because before the, the next session, uh, we will have already duration, especially in the earliest uh, hybrids, as Jeff has mentioned before. Uh, this will be the second time on the season where you can take tissue samples for nutritional purposes. So this is necessary for detecting the deficiencies. On the great blog on June 10, we did a publication of tissue sample if you want to see more information. However, I will be uh, publishing again the next couple of weeks just to remind you that it's time to be taking uh, tissue samples. I received a question about sub samples a couple of weeks ago. That is another way to proceed and to take samples as well. Uh, it doesn't exist as much literature as with tissue sampling, but anyway, the values and the results are quite accurate. So that is another option. I really like with more information, it's better to take decisions. So uh, I, if you want to proceed with a subsample, a tissue sample, is, it can be done perfectly. So now, as every session, I would like to invite uh, Marcel Cole, the manager of Lackett Vineyards, and Steve Els, the owner of Els La Farm, to discuss a little bit more about um, our, they all, their observations in, in the vineyard. Marcel, Steve, good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Francisco. Sorry, sorry for not introducing you. I thought there was another question there, so I, I kind of missed the boat on that one. Sorry. No worries. We were able to fix and navigate through that moment. So I, I already mentioned a couple of things, but I would really like to hear your opinion and your observations and how you're dealing, because uh, it's very easy to talk, but when you have to work in the vineyard, it's, it's a different story. So I would like to start talking about the leaf thing how you're proceeding with these and which are your priorities and your strategies. So Marcel, you said good evening first. So I will start with you. Yeah, so leaf thinning is progressing uh, just as timely as every year. So we were mostly done with the, uh, uh, with the hand thinning in some of the varieties that we wanna have a more open fruit zone. And uh, we're uh, lagging a little behind with the mechanical thinning in some of the hybrids. Um, uh, the wetness out there doesn't help either. So hopefully it'll dry up soon and then we'll get back at it again. And Steve, how is your case? Good, so we're a slightly different strategy. I think the end result is pretty much the same. We tend to do uh, the hybrids first with the machine deliver. So that's all the hybrids have been gone through uh, with the machine. Then we do a very light deleafing in some of the vinifera. Uh, a little susceptible to, to fruit damage with the machine, so we have to be very careful. But uh, yeah, so we uh, we definitely believe in deleafing basically everything in the vineyard, uh, the fruit zone. Uh, just we do the machine first instead of the hand first. Marcel, do you choose a, a specific variety to start with these? Uh, because as Mark, uh, Steve, start with the hybrids. Uh, it's a, 
it's it, it depends a little bit where where the season lies and which varieties are a little bit further ahead or lagging behind. Uh, but mostly it's the uh, special varieties. Uh, we we totally deleave some of the shard, some of the riesling, um, some of the uh, hybrid reds that that we're just one and a half for some of the specialty programs. So these ones we usually do first, and that's where we mainly concentrate our efforts in. Okay. Do you uh, think both sides immediately, or you choose a, a side? Yeah. So with the uh, <clears throat> so with the hand thinning, we do we strip it total. Um, uh, so there is no leaf left in the pruning zone. So we do both sides with the. Mechanical deleafer. Um, in some areas, we only go through on one side first, and then follow up with it about two or three weeks later with the other side. So, so it's like a, a, a slow acclimatization to to the sun, um, and it all it depends a little bit uh, uh, if we're doing some hand picking as well. Uh, there's some varieties. It's a lot easier to get at the fruit when you're when you're going through with the mechanical. Uh, delete for first and then just do a follow-up quick pass by hand and grab a few more so it, it it makes the uh yeah it makes the picking a lot easier um if you just go through by hand very quickly yeah and you steve do you decide a, a side before than other if you distinguish between varieties how to proceed um, uh yeah definitely it's it's varietal the other thing that Enters in there is reentry periods. So sometimes we have to kind of consider what varieties we're hitting with reentry periods of some of the products we're using. So uh, that can make us skip around a little bit just on the spray schedule. Um, but the other thing is very similar. Uh, yeah, I, I would I would say with Marcel's comment about the picking uh, showed out to Lacadie Blanc. I mean, it is tough to pick those if you don't delete. Um, and one thing we always talk about is you can deleaf it uh, earlier in the season, get the benefits on the fruit, or you can deleaf it while you're picking to find the clusters. So you might as well deleaf it early in the season and get the benefits on the fruit. So yeah, definitely. I think it helps a lot with the efficiency of picking and, and it's also really good for the fruit. So um, deleafing is super important to us. We, we deleaf, the only two varieties we don't deleaf are the high wire ones that are trained up high, the muscat and deep pearl, everything in BSB we deleaf. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's a, it's a good and both sides. I, I guess I didn't have both sides, both sides and everything. Yeah. yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So, okay, we already deleted the plants, but anyway, we continue with issues. And already was mentioned by, by Jeff, and I also reinforced about the downy mildew. So, how are you dealing with the downy mildew applications? And Steve, can you, can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, yep. So yet again, I'll just, it's, but, uh, for Downey, you, you got to keep your man, your, um, scope, scope, keep an eye on those oil spots, see how much you have out there. Uh, I think we've all got a spot or two in the vineyard now. I don't think any of us are clean anymore. This year has been just a perfect storm with all the rain and the heat and the humidity. So, uh, it's pretty tough. So we're definitely watching our, our times for our spray. Um, you can't stretch the sprays out at all this year. You have to be very timely with them. Um, so yeah, and, and we're blended. So we, we're using some locally systemic uh, conventional products, uh, but then we're mixing them in, especially on the vinifera with some organic cover-up products. Uh, but the timing is absolutely critical and scouting is critical. Okay. In your case, Marcel, which is your, your approach to this? Uh, well, I very much agree with with Steve on this. Uh, I mean, there is there is day, daily walks now in the vineyard, uh, looking for those oily spots, right, and and trying to calculate out the the right window on when you're out there. Do you have enough time to cover it, and if not, what comes first? Uh, so it's 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 pretty much a, a, a run right now. Um, we should have bought stocks this year for for the chemical companies. <laughs> it's just, uh, yeah, it's just uh, it's crazy what we're putting out. Um, so, but we're 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 doing the same strategy. We have some local systemic uh, products and mix them together 
uh, just with some other DM groups. And uh, so it's it's just trying to stay covered. That's that's the main thing. And Marcel, do you have a different strategy for, for the vinifera ones and for the hybrids? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, the, the, the vinifera definitely get uh, the more attention. Um, uh, and with the hybrids, I have no problem if uh, it, it, this year we're, we're, we're really good in the beginning. Um, and uh, so we skipped, uh, you know, one here or there in the hybrids. Uh, just because we we did have the the, the right weather for it, um, but uh, now with all this humidity and rain, I think we're just going to go and have everything on the same schedule. Okay. okay. Maybe not and the you, same products, but uh, definitely the same schedule. Uh, exactly. Yes. Maybe you are not using the same products, but you have a kind of similar yeah. strategy. Yeah. And 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 Steve, okay, you already explained that you you are approaching different. Uh, the beneath from the hybrids. So which uh, hybrids let you breathe or be more relaxed? <laughs> so I find Lacadie is pretty bulletproof. We definitely, we don't spray it very much after berry set. I find it's it's usually if you get it through to then it's, it's pretty safe, but definitely scoat it lost. And when we see those oil spots, we'll get in there and cover it up. But uh, we let it go pretty long on the interval. Um, some of the other ones, I mean, uh, uh, muscat's pretty good. It, it, we keep an eye on that more for powdery than for downy. Um, so yeah, but it's definitely varietal. Uh, the vinifera, the vinifera all gets the full treatment. It's you can't blink an eye on the vinifera. Like it, it definitely needs a, and chardonnay probably being the one that gets the most attention. We have a lot of chardonnay, so I guess it naturally gets the, the most attention. But um, I find the, even the Pinot Meunier and the, and the Pinot Noir aren't quite as susceptible to downy as Chard is. But, but yeah, very varietal. But the hybrids, yeah, they definitely get uh, a little less spray time this time of year. In your case, Marcel, do you have any particular hybrid that allows you to be much more relaxed so you can take other priorities? Uh, yeah, some of the, uh, actually some of, um, well, definitely the Lacadie, uh, the Osceola, Osceola Mascat is also uh, one that, that I really like because it doesn't take much attention just like the, uh, just like the Lacadie. Um, so, yeah, but, the, but yes, mainly, main, main thing, Benifra. Uh, there's just, there's just no way around. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so... I'm, I'm glad to hear the agreement that you have seen a downy mildew here and there. It's impossible to don't see it, especially with these conditions. And that hybrids allows you to be much more relaxed, especially in Lacadie. So yeah, you cannot be everywhere and you have to prioritize and vinifera for sure. So the, the, the other uh, fungal disease that is paying our attention and it has a huge impact to the crop uh, it's botrytis. So first my question, because it, it's part, and especially after all the precipitation that we had and was coincidentally with the, the bloom, how looks the, the, the bunches and how are you approaching this time of, of botrytis? Marcel, please. So, so yeah, so that, that's where leaf thinning comes in again, right? So. <laughs> So, uh, so yeah, so with the canopy open and having the fruits on uh, to the sunlight, uh, first of all, scouting is a lot easier. You see exactly how far your, your clusters are. Uh, we're starting to see some of them, they're getting close to, to bunch closure. Uh, there's uh, some of the chart definitely. Um, and uh, even some of the reds, like the Lucy, the Leons, the uh, the Triumph, they are all starting to do, uh, uh, getting close to that bunch closure, which means you know hopefully we'll get all the all the fruit zones open, and then we can start thinking about uh, botrytis applications uh, to get in there early enough, uh, especially with all that wetness that we have, but. Uh, um, yeah, with the fruit, with the open fruit zones, uh, a lot of wind gets in there. A lot of moisture will be evaporated very fast in the morning. So um, I'm hoping we get this all done in time. But 
next thing, boat rider sprays, yes. So before going to that direction, Stephen, how you can see everything on your side. Yeah, I agree. I agree with Marcel on that. So I think that leaf getting the pulling the leaves out of the zone does half the work. That's that's half the battle with Petritus right there is getting rid of all those leaves and getting that nice open zone. Um, and we're seeing same thing, bunch closers pretty much through a lot of the vinifera, uh, Pinot Noir, Pinot Mionnet, Shard, that's pretty much all at closure. And uh, even some of the hybrids I find, like the Lacadie and even the Frontenac Law, it's which you think of as a big loose cluster, but uh, and we thought they were all going to be, even the Shard we thought was going to be a nice loose cluster this year. Uh, but with the, with the heat and the precipitation, berry size is up. Uh, I think where we were thinking really good about nice loose clusters for Botrytis, um, you know, to, to help us fight Botrytis. Now we're going to see tight clusters. Um, big berry size is probably already average or above average, and we've got a month and a half to go. So, um, very much the same, pull the leaves, but yeah, we're seeing tighter clusters than we thought, which kind of has me a little worried. So uh, we'll definitely get in there with the uh, specific Botrytis sprays before too long. Marcel, can you see that big berries coming as well? Yes, yeah, I, I think uh, we're seeing the same thing. Uh, it, it seems like the, the bunches haven't stretched this year. It's, it's almost like they, they stopped at one certain point. Not sure if it had anything to do with uh, maybe some of the uh, humidity that we had during bloom, um, but it almost seems like the cluster is not as long. It seems to be less berries, but overall bigger in size. Um, so, so it's definitely going to be interesting to to see when how big those class or those berries are actually going to be. Okay, interesting and. Which is your approach uh, against botrytis? When are you applying for first time? Uh, how many times are you expecting? Um, so we're, we're trying to, well, first of all, we're trying to get the leaves out first. Uh, and I think we, we're gonna have enough time to get it all done before we are going in with our first application. I'm not sure yet which product we're going to be using, maybe depending a little bit on, on what the weather is like uh, during that period, but I'm going to try to at least get one inside the cluster, um, especially in Riesling and Chard, um, and uh, hopefully get uh, one more on uh, about, uh, about three weeks later. Uh, definitely combine it with calcium, um, uh, for, for the clusters, um, has, uh, has a lot of benefits, especially if you're in varieties that are uh, prone to splitting. Okay. Good point and good, good strategy. Steve, which is your approach to, to this? Yep. So, uh, much the same. Uh, and we, we start thinking about Botrytis very early on, uh, I even kind of have it in the back of my head at bloom and, and sometimes the chemicals that we. Uh, think about applying at that kind of late bloom or pre-bloom. Um, I, I like those ones, like some of the 7 or 11s or 33s that, that do uh, downy and, and powdery, but they also have a bit of a suppression factor in botrytis. And uh, sometimes picking those chemicals and, and even in the organic side, you know, if you're putting that copper spray on early, um, maybe instead of that, you want to, uh, something like a serenade because that does have a bit of a, a protection for two or three different things there. So, and uh, I think Regalia Max too can kind of do downy and, and uh, Botrytis at the same time. So I really like the thinking about that way back at the, at the bloom time. Um, but then, yeah, for sure, we want to get a really good one in there just before closure and then early Veraison. We want to put that one on the, and the Veraison one is the one where we probably do just a fruit zone and uh, mix calcium with it. But those, last couple sprays before you're targeting that one, I would think about calcium in there as well, like on the, on the whole foliage when you're getting in there for downy protection and stuff. Calcium is pretty important to get on there. And, and you know, uh, we just don't have time to do two or three sprays on just the fruit. Um, so we do just mix it in when we're trying to protect the, can the whole canopy, just to get a little more calcium on. Yeah, it's, it's the way, it's done enough time, no? 
we're quite stretched of time. Well, I, I, these were my three main points that I wanted to talk with you. The leaf thinning, because it's crucial, yes, to open the fruit zone. It's not only for, at the end, for the fungal disease management, also will help definitely to keep some of protection or resistance to the berries to the sun, and also will help to, to ripe the fruit. Downy mildew, because with these conditions, uh, we are in risk, we have to be honest. And botrytis, because it's always something uh, that can appear and we don't take the preventive measurements, it, it, it can be difficult. So that was uh, all from me, uh, Marcel and Steve. Thank you very much for, for your collaboration and discussion. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Always a pleasure. Okay, so I will be closing the, the session. I would like to thank everyone, especially Dr. De Moro for her nice presentation update. Jeff Franklin, because if it's not recorded, I couldn't believe we were on time. And, and the nice, um, a nice discussions. I think we covered overall all the topics, the main, main things happening in entomology, climate-wise, the phenology of the plant and diseases. So thank you very much for, for your attention, your participation, and keep tuned to the great blog where we'll be updating more things and uh, uploading this session. And for the next best practice session, which I suppose will be at the end of August, uh, beginning of September. Okay, so thank you very much. And thanks to Perenia for doing this. Thanks, Steve.